Welcome to module one, the role of agriculture in rural and economic development. This is the first module out of five for the course on women and youth empowerment in agriculture. This module introduces you to the role of agriculture in rural and economic development. It highlights the state of African agriculture, including the structure and organization of African agriculture. The module examines economic growth as determined by the productivity of its in principal determinants, such as access to capital and labor, and insists that agriculture is important for economic growth and development. At the end of this module, you, the course participants, are expected to be knowledgeable on the rules of agriculture in rural and economic development for the empowerment of women and youth in particular. Af Africa is one of the fastest growing continents in the world. The population has doubled. And in some areas, particularly in the urban sector, it is reported that the population has tripled. According to the World Economic Forum, Africa remains central to the future of the modern world. With 2.2 billion people expected by 2050 and more than 4 billion by the year 2100, Africa is the only region where the maximum population size will not be reached within this century. It will expand even beyond. So there is some potential. Sub-Saharan Africa could count for more than half of the world's population growth between now and 2050 with the projected addition of 1 billion people. In fact, Sub-Saharan Africa's population currently is growing at almost 2.8% per year is going to double the rate of South Asia, four times that of East Asia and the Pacific, and about 50% higher than the Middle East and North Africa. This rapid population growth is a, both an opportunity and a challenge, foiled by high fertility rates, is driving increased demand for food. And when demand for food increases, it's also an opportunity and a challenge. Therefore, it is important that we reflect on the future of agriculture and its ability to satisfy growing food demand, particularly for Sub-Saharan Africa, where 60% of the population are smallholder farmers. And despite our rapid urbanization, the population in rural areas has also continued to increase in absolute terms. The most direct consequence of this exponential population growth is that the continent now has more mouths to feed. But despite having more mouths to feed, cereal production has not kept pace with the population. You know, now with imported consumption habits and patterns, most Africans and African households do no more rely on their staples of tubers. They, we are now being attracted more by cereals of rice, millet, sorghum, wheat, and wheat flour for the production of bread. Therefore, with a growing population and cereal production not keeping pace with that, it's, a, it's an important challenge. And this gap is even wider for processed products and meat, which are increasingly called for by a larger and larger urban population. From being self-sufficient in the 60s, Africa has become a net importer of cereals. Africa imports products that compete with its own products. Africa imports meat, dairy products, cereals and oils, and imports of these commodities into Africa account for almost two times the value of exports. As a result, African agricultural exports have fallen by half since the mid 1990s. So despite all of this, agriculture still has promise because it is Africa's ancestral heritage. It remains a life wire for most countries in the continent with the farming systems mainly relying on family resources. Now in Africa, it's estimated there are 33 million farms of less than two hectares, accounting for almost 80% of all farms. Over the last 10 years, large scale investment contracts in Africa have covered 20 million hectares, which represents more than the arable area of South Africa and Zimbabwe combined. These large scale investment were heralded and trumpeted a lot in the media of foreign investors who came into the continent and were interested in 
land grabbing so that they can grow crops. But unfortunately, this was supposedly agricultural production, not meant for, agri for consumption in Africa or for industrial use in Africa, but for exports to other countries. So what is at stake for agri Africa's agriculture and food security? There are many challenges which can be classified into economic challenges, human challenges, environmental challenges, and political challenges. So which present themselves as the key stakes in Africa. For the economic challenges, more than half of all people living in Africa depend on agriculture for their livelihood. It's an important challenge. It means over-reliance on small-scale agriculture, and this breeds poverty. Fostering sustainable agricultural growth means working to boost income and to improve the living conditions. Promoting agricultural growth also spurs economic development in upstream and downstream sectors. And promoting agricultural growth creates jobs within the agricultural value chain. There are also varying labor requirements for the different forms of agriculture. An important challenge is that we have to promote industrial agriculture. African agriculture can no longer remain small. However, this creates fewer jobs than modern fam family farming, which are predominant in the continent. In Africa, both the industrial plantations and family farms need to be integrated and balanced. We cannot say that, or we cannot recommend only industrial commercial agriculture to Africa because, because land itself by its nature, it's, it's, a scarce, it's a scarce commodity. And by our sociological and anthropological historical journey, African farms have been carved into smaller and smaller portions over the, over the years because of social needs, where family, because of fam social needs such as family inheritance. There are also human challenges, food and nutrition insecurity, rapid population growth, accelerating urbanization. Although agricultural development alone is unable to eliminate hunger and malnutrition, it is an obligatory element to address food insecurity. The burden of rural areas through underdevelopment poses a challenge. Protecting rural activity systems is also a determining factor. This will occur either by securing land access, particularly for women and young people, by controlling and minimizing agricultural risks, by diversifying agricultural activity systems and sources, or by improving the structuring and regulation markets. On the face of the economic challenges, the human challenges, there are also environmental challenges that face the African agricultural economy. Examples of environmental challenge include the declining fertility of soils, land degradation, deforestation, climate variation and climate change, with, uh, which are topical issues, but also practically omnipresent in the African agricultural landscape. The challenge in coming years, therefore, is to promote sustainable management, not only of natural resources, but also, also to ensure sustainable agricultural production and accelerate growth in production and productivity. This can be achieved by controlling the impact of the environment on natural resources such as land, water, and energy, as well as foster or promote the adaptability of farming systems to climate change. On the back of environmental ch challenges, you have political challenges, which are prevalent across the continent, increasing civil strife, political instability, structural tensions, and so on. There is therefore need to reaffirm so sovereignty and contribute to stability, security, and Africa's international standing. We have to put so much effort to get the story right on good governance, to get the story right on performing institutions and reduce the extent and proliferation of civil strife, political instability, and structural tensions which are pervasive within, within our countries. Within the context of structural tensions in global food markets too, Africa with its considerable and underexploited agricultural potential has a strong case on the international geopolitical stage to seek for partnerships which will contribute to reduce political tensions. The African continent as a whole can at least satisfy most of its demand if it manages to exploit its internal complementarities. In other words, we have to get our act together, get uh, make sure policy is working and delivering for the people. When we talk of 
the role of agriculture in Africa's economic growth and, and development. We cannot look at such a model without zero in on agricultural growth and economic development. What are they? What do we mean by economic growth? And what do we mean by economic development? And what is agricultural growth? Agricultural growth is the increase in agricultural output. And economic growth is the increase in economic output, typically measured by an increase in the gross domestic product, the GDP. And economic development is not only economic growth, but a complete improvement in the infrastructure that leads to economic growth, as well as improvement in the living conditions and living standards and welfare of the people, better access to education, improved access to health, better nutrition, and modern infrastructure. And agriculture too can play an important role for Africa's economic development and emergence because agriculture in Africa has a massive social and economic footprint, but its full agricultural potential remains untapped. The agricultural sector's growth has lagged behind national economic growth in the continent. Given that most poor people are dependent on farming, this low growth is an obstacle to regional poverty reduction and African policymakers will have to include an emphasis on agricultural growth and as well as increase average yields in cereals in Africa so that it begins to compete favorably with that from the Asia. Agricultural growth in Africa is generally achieved by cultivating more land and by mobilizing a larger agricultural labor force, which produces very little improvements in yield. So agricultural growth over the years, increasing the volume of production over the years has been achieved by simply accessing more lands. And this comes with an environmental challenge of deforestation, de degradation, degradation, and preventing the African forest and biodiversity from contributing in its important service role in regulating global and immediate climate. Agriculture nonetheless is crucial to economic growth, but it has to be practiced sustainably. In 2019, for example, agriculture accounted for 4% of global gross domestic product. And in some African countries, it accounts for more than 25% of GDP. The underperforming agricultural sector in Africa, however, is not just delaying economic transformation, therefore, but it is also contributing to higher poverty rates because that is a sector which employs most of the people. And if it is not performing, therefore it can be blamed squarely on the poverty rates. Managing the growth of the economy requires raising productivity in agriculture and in the rural economy while diversifying into higher value goods outside of agriculture. For several decades, Sub-Saharan Africa has stood out through the major challenges that beset it. So Afri agriculture alone, um, agriculture has the potential, but it cannot be blamed for all the difficulties that the continent has faced. Agriculture has held firm in most of the countries within the sub-Saharan area, sub-Saharan zones in West Africa, in Central Africa, in East Africa, and even in parts of North Africa. Okay. However, challenges, while worrisome, can be transformed into opportunities that can strengthen African agriculture. We can transform the human, the economic, the environmental, and the political challenges into benefits for the continent, transforming it into a vehicle for inclusive economic growth, achieving the objectives as shown, as we shall sh show you in the figure um, below. Economic models have shown that agricultural growth and its transformation is an integral part of economic development. And these models include the economic development model by Lewis, by, by Lewis, the economic development model by Fay and Rannis, the economic development model by Rosto, the economic development model by Harold and Doma, as well as the famous solo growth economic development model. This is our figure to tell you about development. Development comprises of two key issues. The quantitative changes that will take place, as well as 
at the bottom here, the qualitative changes. The quantitative changes of development is associated with growth. The pie has to be bigger. The cake being baked has to be bigger. The, in other words, the production has to happen, has to be bigger. And it is this production which has to, which will be shared to the many members of society and they too begin to feel that something is happening. And growth will come through modernization as well as increasing incomes. Growth leads to increasing incomes. And when you have increasing incomes, you have increasing material goods being purchased by individuals and households. And you also have increasing material well-being and the overall feel good factor. And modernization, like we're seeing today across some sectors of the continent, not only leads to uh, development, but promotes increasing consumption, as well as the capacity to provide for basic goods and basic, basic needs. On the qualitative side of things, when development happens, people begin to feel that they have rights and freedoms which are being addressed. They have more choices for goods and commodities to select. They feel empowered. Ex there is expanding human capabilities as well as taking advantage of the opportunities that have come from the quantitative side of things, which has increased incomes. With development and imp improvement in the quality of life, living standards and conditions, there is also enhanced human rights, increasing participation and redistributive justice. People begin to feel that they are also members of the community. Therefore, in his wisdom, Otto Lewis, a famous economist in his theory, he puts very squarely the role of agriculture in contributing to this economic growth and development. And he said in his theory that it, it is about development in which surplus labor from traditional agriculture is transferred to the modern industrial sector whose growth over time absorbs the surplus labor, promotes industrialization, and stimulates sustained development. Lewis, this model can be summarized as what they call a surplus labor model. In other words, when agriculture improves, the surplus labor engaged in agriculture will be released technically and be picked up by the industrial, by the industrial, by the industrial sector. So the surplus labor, underemployed, overemployed, idle labor in rural areas because of industrialization will leave the rural areas, migrate out of the rural areas and picked up by the industrial manufacturing sector. The Lewis model explains the growth of a developing economy in terms of a labor transition between two sectors, the capitalist sector and the subsistence sector. Here we have the Lewis's dual, set, dual sector model of growth. On the far left, traditional agricultural sector, which is prevalent in most African countries. If we provide the necessary resources and, and the productivity increases in the agricultural sector, incomes get better, output gets better, revenue is raised. The, because of the mod, in, increasing modernization of the agricultural sector, the surplus labor, idle labor will be released and they will move, they will be picked up by the manufacturing processing sector. And when the manufacturing processing sector grows, it keeps attracting more manufacturing, more investors, and reproducing more goods and services in the community. And the manufacturing sector gets bigger. When the manufacturing sector gets bigger, some of the commodities being produced in the manufacturing sector will be picked up as modern machines in the traditional agricultural sector for the agricultural sector again to get better and release more surplus labor as the productivity within the traditional agricultural sector has increased. And therefore the surplus labor now moves into manufacturing and the process, the process continues where manufacturing has supply of raw materials from the agricultural sector, attracts surplus labor from the agricultural sector. And those in the agricultural sector, they get uh, salaries, they get being paid, they have wages which they consume and they also save. And the savings are being picked up by entrepreneurs and reinvested back into the agricultural sector. And therefore the manufacturing sector keeps increasing. So it is a dual sector model which shows the agricultural sector on one hand and the manufacturing sector on the other hand. 
showing an increased relationship of surplus labor, generation of investments and savings, and capital growth which in the manufacturing sector, which reinforces the traditional, traditional sector. After the Lewis's model, another interesting model that we have is the Fay and Rennes model from two economists, John Fay and Gustav Rennes, who presented their, their own dual economy model. It explains how the increased productivity in the agricultural sector will become helpful in promoting industrial sector. They too demonstrated that on, in three stages, an underdeveloped country can move from stagnation to self-sustained economic growth. Hence, the Fay Rennes model is treated as an improvement over the Lewis's model of unlimited labor supply. The model is also known as the surplus labor model. It recognizes the presence of a dual economy, just like the Lewis's model, comprising both the modern and the primitive sector, and takes the economic situation of unemployment and underemployment into account. According to the Fay Rennes model, the primitive sector consists of the existing agricultural sector in the economy, and the modern sector is rapidly emerging, but still a small industrial sector. Both the agricultural sector and the industrial sector exist side by side, and herein lies the crux of the development problem. You know, having simultaneously a small scale peasantry, primitive subsistence agriculture, and on the other hand, you have a modern industrial sector. And according to Fay and Rennes, development can be brought about only by a complete shift in the focal point of progress from the agricultural to the industrial economy, such that there is augmentation of industrial output. This is done by transfer of surplus level from the agricultural sector to the industrial one, showing that underdeveloped countries do not suffer from constraints of labor supply. At, a at the same time, growth in the agricultural sector must not be negligible and its output should be sufficient to support the whole economy with food and raw materials. So we've, we've seen two models, the Lewis model and the Fay and Rannis model, which are typically surplus labor models and shows the existence of two sectors, the agricultural sector and the manufacturing um, industrial, industrial sector. On the back of that, we have the Rosto stages of growth model. Rosto's stages of economic growth model is another major historical model of economic growth, which shows the importance of both agriculture and the rural areas. Rosto viewed the process of development as a series of successful stages of economic growth through which all the advanced nations of the world have passed through as all the modern industrial nations of the world were once underdeveloped peasant agrarian economies like you have today in Africa. So according to Rosto, rich countries of the United States, Europe, Australia, Canada, Japan, were one time in their economy or in their, in, in their economic history having the same conditions like we have today in Africa. You know? So according to Rosto, the historical experience of these countries that have finally developed and emerged in transforming their economies from poor agriculture-based subsistence societies to modern industrial giants has important lessons for Africa. And as he showed, the model, his model postulated that economic growth occurs in five basic stages of varying length. The traditional society, the preconditions for takeoff, the takeoff stage, the drive to maturity, and the age of high mass consumption. Here we have a diagra diagrammatic representation of Rostov's growth stage theory. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four and five. And according to uh, Rostow, countries in the world in their economic history have gone through these different stages, beginning from stage one, which is the traditional society. Then they move to stage two, the transition stage, and provide the preconditions for takeoff. And economists now later move from stage two to stage three, where it is ready for takeoff. Then they, they go to stage four, which is the drive to maturity, and then stage five, the high mass consumption. When you look at this um, diagram and the arrow going up over time and development improving, you begin. You may ask yourself, in which stage is your country now? Is your country still in stage one? Are you in stage two? Are you in stage three? Countries 
in the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which, which has all the rich countries in the world, they're already in stage five, the stage of high mass consumption. When you, when the countries are in the traditional society, here they have subsistence, subsistence agriculture, subsistence economy, trade by butter. And when they are in the transitional stage, when they are in the transitional stage, there is in, increased specialization, generation of not only some surplus labor, but also surplus output. And then there is improvements in infrastructure. And this helps those countries to move across to the stage of takeoff. But at the stage of takeoff, countries have established some levels of industrialization, <clears throat> innovation, and technology has taken place. The investment climate has been improved upon, and there is political stability and political change in which the countries now are able to catapult themselves to move forward to drive and, and, and move to the next stage, which is the drive to maturity. At the drive to maturity, there is more diversification, not only in the agricultural sector, but diversi diversification in the economy in general, having different subsectors performing well in the economy. There is in innovation, increased innovation and, and technology. There are increased investments in all the sectors, national investments, and as well as foreign direct investments. And the countries also finally move, they finally move to high mass consumption where they have emerged with the dominant sector being the service, service sector with high consumer goods. So according to Rostow, countries have moved, moved across all of the stages. And he was reflecting that if this is what has happened to modern industrial, modern developed countries, then it can also happen to or underdeveloped countries as it is prevalent in the African uh, continent. Building on the Rostow growth stages theory, you also have the Harold Doma growth model. So policy planners in the continent of Africa and, um, and theorists have examined this model to look at its relevance for the African continent. Uh, we are doing a model on agriculture and economic, uh, and economic development to see its place that, and opportunities that can accrue for women and youth. And therefore it is instructive that we examine the philosophy and theories that have been put by such founding fathers, intellectuals and philosophers. And later we are going to nail this down to see if the items that have been, the factors that have been identified by Harold and Doma, by Solo, by Lewis, as well as Rostov, whether those factors play in the African economy, in the rural areas of our continent, and how we can manipulate those factors to, for us also to achieve our own economic growth, as well as our own economic development. The Harold Doma model is a Keynesian model of economic growth used in development economics to explain economic growth rate in terms of what? Savings and capital. When you hear of the Harold Doma model, you should think of two things, savings and capital. The Harold Doma economic growth model stresses the importance of savings. Savings, money that is kept in the banks, in the commercial banks, and investments as key determinants of growth. According to, to the Harold Doma model, capital is the crucial factor of economic growth. And for you to have capital, surplus has to be generated, sent to the industrial sector, and income obtained and saved in the banks. And someone moves into the banks, an entrepreneur, in this case, an agricultural entrepreneur, borrows the savings and invests back into the economy. And when you invest into the economy, you are investing in machines, you are investing in capital. And this generates and increases, again, the capa production capacity in, in the country. So the Harold Doma model is about two key issues, savings, which is later borrowed and invested to generate more capital, which is used as an input in the economy to create more wealth. The Harodoma model therefore argues that in developing countries such as in Africa, the rates of economic growth and development are linked to low savings rates. So he blamed African countries that changes are not taking place, economic growth is not happening, development is not happening 
because there are low levels of savings. You need to save money in banks, in commercial banks, and commercial banks which are performing very well. And investors need to borrow that money. And there are conditions to make sure that when you borrow money, you repay the money so that those who have saved their money can recuperate their money. But when you borrow the money, you also invest it, not, you do not waste it in idle consumption, but you invest it on wealth creating consumption by purchasing machines, which again would facilitate production within the economy. This creates a vicious cycle of low investment in Africa because of low savings. And because of low savings, there is a, we are in a vicious cycle of low investment, low output and low savings. To boost economic growth rates, it is therefore necessary to increase savings either domestically or from abroad. Higher savings create a virtual cycle of self-sustaining economic growth. The transfer of capital to developing economies should enable higher growth, which in turn will lead to higher savings and growth will become more self-sustaining. This is the thinking of international economists that foreign direct investments back into the African continent will generate higher growth, increase incomes, in turn, increase savings, later increased investments, and investments in the economy, in the agricultural sector and other sectors will create more wealth, and more wealth creates again more savings, and more savings, more investment. So it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. So here is a summary of the Harodoma model, talking, which demonstrates the rate of economic growth leading to two key issues, improvement of savings, as well as improvement of investment, measured here as the marginal efficiency of capital, where capital depreciation you know, is accounted for. The cycle, the, doc, the, the figure on the, on the lower bottom right of the Harold Doma model demonstrates the vicious cycle, which must be tapped into for increased savings in banks, and the money is borrowed, leads to increased investments and increased investments. They are spending it not on wasteful consumption, but on reproductive consumption, such as investments in capital stock. And this capital, machinery capital, financial capital, human capital, social capital, works in the economy to generate higher economic growth. Once you have higher economic growth, and wages are being generated and labor has paid, you have better incomes, they can afford to save. And when they can afford to save, other investors pick up the savings and invest. And therefore, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. In summary, therefore, the model describes implications for less economically developed countries where labor is plentiful in supply, but physical capital is not. Uh, a country which does not have enough physical capital of machines and equipments, it will slow down its economic progress. And less developed countries do not have sufficiently high incomes to enable sufficient rates of savings. Therefore, accumulation of physical capital stock through investment is very low. The Harold Doman growth model implies that economic growth depends on government policies to increase investment by increasing savings and using that investment more efficiently through technological advances. Finally, on the growth models which we are examining on this module is the solo growth model. Robert Solo, a Nobel Prize winning economist, posited an exogenous model of economic growth that analyzes changes in the level of output in an economy over time as a result of changes in the population growth rate, the savings rate, and the rate of technological progress. The solo growth model focuses on long-run economic growth. And at the center of the solo growth model is your neoclassical aggregate production function. OK, an increase in savings, according to Solo, an investment raises the capital stock, and this raises employment, moving up into full employment in the national economy, which generates national income and, and gross domestic product. In the short run, if there, is, there are more savings and there are more investments, this rate raises the rate of growth of the national income and, and the gross domestic product. According to Professor Solo, 
growth model in contrast, higher saving and investment has no effect on the rate of growth in the long run. So in the short run, we're gonna have significant improvement in the economy from higher savings and higher investment. In the long run, the economy moves into what he referred to as a steady state of economic growth. If the economy is a competitive market economy, the real interest rates, that is the returns to, to capital in banks, and the real wage rate, that is the return to, to labor, in the long run, they are all constant. But he reminds us of two things, two changes. If there is change in population growth, so it is population growth that will cause that steady state to change in the long run. In the long run, the rate of population growth sets the long run growth rate of the economy. As the population increases, there are more mouths to feed. There is a need to produce more goods and services for the increasing population. There is need to provide more services for the growing population, food, clothing, housing. In other words, there's an increase in demand from the change in population. Then the long run growth in its steady state can still be modified and the economy keeps growing. If the population growth rate rises, the capital widening also rises in the steady state and the real interest rate will be higher and the real wage rate is lower. Higher population growth lowers the level of output per person. We have to be careful on that. Higher population growth lowers the level of output per person. In other words, he's calling our attention on the fact that with the higher population, you have to build the capacity. It has to be a productive population. If you have higher population, which is unemployed, underemployed, low income, low wages, then it becomes a problem. So for you to have increased growth in the long run, a higher population matters and the population has to be a productive, a productive population. He reminded us again of savings rate, if the saving rate changes, okay? He says, although the saving rate raises the rate of economic growth in the short run, it may have no effect of growth on the growth in the long run. Hence, the steady state output per capita may rise since a higher savings rate raises the productivity of capital, okay? Then he says that when the economy is at equilibrium, referred to here as a steady state, interest rate matters. So the summary of solo growth model is that governments have to be able to play with, with policies to, to, to influence the saving rates in the economy. When government plays with policy to influence the savings rate, for example, lower the interest rates, For those who are taking loans or increases the, in the interest rate. And more income is produced, the economy grows. Here are uh, two summaries of the solo growth model. Here we start with what we have in purple, which shows the potential output. This, this second figure shows how technology can change this output. This is the output curve. Here, the output curves are multiplied. There are many output curves. There are many potential output curves. For you to move from output number one to output number two, output number three, output number four, at higher levels, you need require technology. You require innovation <clears throat> and most, of most people, people typically refer to these as machines, <clears throat> but there are also other kinds of technology. You have biological technology of high yielding seeds. You have modern technologies of 
fertilizers or the green revolution technologies. So <clears throat> technologies can cause the output to keep increasing. And for each level of technology, you are having higher levels of output. In summary, we have an implication of the solo growth model that if countries have the same population, growth rate, savings, and capital depreciation, <clears throat> then they have the same steady state, so they will converge. So he so solo identified three key factors: population growth, savings, investments, and capital depreciation as important to contribute to economic growth. Countries with different savings rates will have different steady, steady states. When saving rates are different, growth is not always higher in a country with a lower initial capital stock. So government policy should be able to promote that, promote growth rates, promote savings, promote in investments. In the case of the agricultural sector, agriculture is an important driver of economic growth. In the short run, agriculture stimulates economic growth. In the long run, agriculture has significant association with economic growth. Therefore, the neglect of agriculture and excessive focus on industrialization in some countries by some leaders and policymakers may retard growth both in the short run and in the long run. An important question that comes to mind is where will agricultural growth in Africa now come from? As we've seen from the growth theories, Faye Rennes, the Lewis surplus labor model, the solo model, the Harodoma model, and the Rosto growth stages theory, where will agricultural growth in Africa come from so that it can, agriculture can contribute to economic growth and economic development? It can come from availability and access to modern inputs. So this is the technology, modern inputs, modern inputs of fertilizer, of pesticides, of herbicides, modern inputs of improved seeds and biotechnology, modern inputs of digital, digital technology, innovation and technology, infrastructure, linking farm to markets, ma markets, rural areas to urban centers, you know, storage infrastructure, road infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, IT infrastructure, market and trade access. Because when bumper harvest is produced in the rural areas, bumper harvest is produced in the farms, they have to be swept off by some consumers. Therefore, market must be made hold and encouraged to perform well so that they can be exchanged, as well as trade access, domestic trade and international trade, regional trade and international trade. According to the McKinsey Institute, therefore, realizing Africa's full agricultural potential will require significant investments, okay? Will require significant investments to provide for infrastructure, market infrastructure, to provide for technology, to fund research and the production of modern inputs. McKinsey Institute says, realizing full agricultural potential will require significant investments. Sub-Saharan Africa will need eight times more fertilizer, six times more improved seeds, at least $8 billion of investment in basic and as much as $65 billion in irrigation to fulfill the promise of the agricultural sector and to the economy. Much investment, says McKinsey Institute, will also be needed in basic infrastructure such as what? Roads, ports, electricity, plus investments in policies and regional trade flows. So this is the fate of the African continent. And this is the fate of the agricultural sector in fulfilling its promise for Africa's economic emergence and transition. But this is not new. The leaders of the world, together with African heads of states, have realized the importance of these issues. And in the year 2000, we had the Millennium Development Goals. And examination across countries, very few countries made progress on all the eight Millennium Development Goals. And therefore, by the year 2015, the Millennium Development Goals were revised to account for other goals on human development, as well as improve on the indicators and to ensure that development is viewed in a broad 
prism. In, in other words, the Millennium Development Goals were replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals. As we speak, almost 800 million people suffer hunger globally, tackling hunger <clears throat> and malnutrition is not only about boosting food production, but also to do with increasing incomes, creating resilient food systems, and strengthening markets so that people can access safe and nutritious food, even if a crisis prevents them from growing enough themselves. The 2030 Agenda of the United Nations under a sustainable development mission adopted by member states in 2015 was about a new set of global development goals to shape policies, programs, and funding. And it included 17 SDGs based on the Millennium Development Goals and including new ones such as climate change, economic inequality, innovation, sustainable consumption, among other priorities. The 2030 Agenda recognized that we can no longer look at food and livelihoods and the management of natural resources separately. A focus on rural development and investment in agriculture, whether crops, livestock, forestry, fisheries, and aqu aquaculture are powerful tools to end poverty and hunger and bring about sustainable development. Agriculture, the head of state intimated, has a major role to play in combating climate change. Therefore, the SDGs emphasize the importance of agriculture and the need to reinvigorate farming worldwide by supporting farmers, increasing investments in research, technology, and market infrastructure, and extending knowledge sharing. They conclude that this may catalyze innovation and empower farmers. Here we have the 17 SDGs. On no, number one, on no poverty. Number two, zero hunger. Number three, good health and well-being. Number four, quality education. Number five, gender equality. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Number seven, affordable and clean energy. Number eight, decent work and economic growth. Number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Number 10, reduced inequalities. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Number 12, responsible consumption and production. Number 13, climate action. Number 14, life below water. Number 15, life on land. Number 16, peace and justice, as well as number 17, SDG, partnerships for the goals. So these goals have many indicators and many targets. When you look at the reading materials and you open up on the links that were provided, you will see the different targets and the different indicators which can be used to measure whether these goals are being, are being achieved. Now, what is the place of agriculture within these SDGs? What is, how, how is agriculture factored within the SDGs? Agriculture is key to achieving sustainable, the sustainable development goals, okay? More than any other sector, agriculture is a common thread which holds the 17 SDGs together. Almost half of SDGs are related to agricultural sector. And this is an excellent opportunity to motivate governments and producers. Access to quality and nutritious food is primary for human living and directly affects economic growth. SDG number two specifically identifies zero hunger, which is about food. Almost 9% of, of the world's population faces hunger daily. So one in nine people goes hungry every day. The farmers and growers face a challenge to meet the demand of the growing population. SDG number five is explicit on gender equality. And we are aware that women in agriculture are the predominant force in agriculture. And by monitoring women's land ownership and women's equal rights to land ownership, SDG number five begins to put squarely the role of agriculture in economic growth and economic emergence. SDG number six is on clean water and sanitation. Since water is an essential component for healthy and nutritious food, there is need to regulate water use and water stress to maintain the agricultural development process. The SDG number 12, which is a goal on responsible production and consumption. And SDG number 14 is about life below water. SDG number 15, life on land, all of them have a component that deals with agriculture. For example, in SDG number 12, around 14% of food losses yearly affect both growers and consumers 
by raising the prices and reducing food available for consumption. We must monitor food losses and waste and implement activities for responsible food production. For life below water, that includes fish, which is food, which is also a raw material for the industrial manufacturing. Fish stocks are already threatened by climate change, illegal fishing and excessive consumption, or also threatened fish stocks. There is need to regulate these issues to conserve the biodiversity and sustainable use of marine and ocean resources. And the SDG 15 on life on land, since the world is experiencing massive forest damage and many species losing their habitats, we must encourage sustainable practices of resource management. In other words, agriculture appears in most of the SDGs than any other so sector. It is, again, like it is said, the most important sector that weaves through the 17 SDGs. The agricultural sector is therefore well placed to realize the SDGs, given the sector's potential to contribute to increased food security, poverty alleviation, and reduce child mortality through better nutrition, amongst other factors. Healthy, sustainable, and inclusive food systems are therefore crucial to achieve the SDGs. Investing in the agricultural sector, for example, can address not only hunger and malnutrition, but also other challenges, including poverty, water and energy use, climate change, and sustainable production and consumption. So this is very, very interesting to see that agriculture fits squarely into an important role where it plays a meaningful pathway, provides a meaningful pathway for rural development, economic development, and overall emergence of African states. But African leaders are not oblivious on the role of agriculture. That is why if you look at most of the documents in the last two decades being produced by the African Union to improve the welfare of Africans, agriculture is captured vividly in most of the policy statements that have been produced. Cognizant of the multiple challenges faced by African agriculture, agriculture became a priority in the development agenda of the African Union, with its heads of states signing the Maputo Declaration, as well as the Malabo Declaration, building up to they also signing the 2030 Agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. In 2013, African heads of state signed the Agenda 2063, christened or nicknamed the Africa We Want. Agenda 2063 has been heralded, praised as Africa's blueprint and master plan for transforming the continent into the global powerhouse of the future. It is a strategic document that puts squarely the strategic framework that aims to deliver on its goal for inclusive and sustainable development. And it is a concrete manifestation of the Pan-African drive for unity by the 54 member states of the African Union, self-determination, freedom, progress, and collective prosperity pursued under Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance. Agricultural progress and development features prominently as an important pillar for the continent's transition and development. In other words, government statements at the highest level of governance continue to echo the role, the importance, the capacity, the potentials of agriculture in contributing significantly to Africa's development journey. In the Agenda 2063 document of the African Union, the agricultural vision comes out very clearly for the Africa we want, for our children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Aspirations are identified. Aspiration number one, a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Aspiration number two, for the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, 
is about integrated continent linked together, politically united and based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of Africa's renaissance. Aspiration three, an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice and the rule of law. Aspiration four, a peaceful and secure Africa. Aspiration five, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage and shared values and ethics. Aspiration six, an Africa whose development is people dreaming, relying on the potential of African people, especially its women and youth and caring for children. Aspiration seven, Africa as strong, united, resilient, and, influ and an influential global player and partner. So these aspirations of the African Union under its agenda 2063 are not disunited, are not disjointed. For the Africa we want, when you go through the rural landscape, and the predominant economic activity in the rural areas being agriculture, being agriculture. Then even the aspirations of the African Union allows African states to put in massive effort to improve in the rural areas and improve in the welfare of women, women and youth. The goals of Agenda 2063, the African we want, is also about ensuring a higher standard of living, quality of life and well-being for all of the citizens, educated citizens, healthy and well-nourished citizens, transform economies, modern agriculture, improved oceans that addresses and captures the ideals of sustainable develop economic growth, environmentally sustainable and climate resilient economies, a united Africa, continental financial and monetary institutions to be established, world-class infrastructure to crisscross the continent, an Africa of democratic values with capable institutions, as well as an Africa where peace, security and stability reigns, a continent that is stable, fully functional, and its cultural re renaissance harnessed. Full gender equality in all spheres of life appears very strongly and tenaciously in the Africa Union Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, as well as an engaged and empowered youth and children. The African leaders, as an agenda for the Africa we want, sees the continent as a major partner in global affairs and peaceful, peaceful coexistence as well as Africa that takes full responsibility for financing in its own development. And there are many priority areas in the Agenda 2063 document of the African Union. Creation of jobs and decent work, poverty and inequality and hunger re reduction, social security, modern and li livable habitats, education, you know, and technology skills driven, Africa, health and nutrition catered for, sustainable and inclusive economic growth, you know, sustainable transition and technological innovation driven by manufacturing, industrialization and value addition, economic diversification and resilient Africa, the tourism sector, it's a priority area, agriculture, a priority area, marine, a priority area, ports operations, sustainable natural resource management, consumption, water, climate, renewable energy, you know, institutional setups, financial and monetary institutions, communication and infrastructure, democracy, good governance, institutions and leadership, freedom and justice and human rights, participatory development, maintenance and preservation of peace and security, okay? An Africa that espouses the ideals of Pan-Africanism, cultural values, cultural heritage, women and girls empowerment, reduction of violence and discrimination against women and girls, youth empowerment and children. An Africa whose place in global affairs is well secured as a veritable partner, 
an Africa capital market where opportunities can be created for the raising of financial capital to serve the needs of the emerging industries, enterprises in the continent. Yenin an investment capital so they can grow their businesses in Africa where the fiscal system and public sector revenues are also important as well as with development assistance. So in summary and in conclusion, with respect to the progress made by progress made by all the, the development exposed by African leaders in their agenda 2063 encapsulates not only Africa's aspirations for the future, but it also identifies key flagship programs which can boost the continent's economic growth and development. For Africa to achieve Agenda 2063, aspiration for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, the continent needs to invest massively and clearly in modern agriculture for increased productivity and production, as well as exploit the vast potential of the oceans and the seas. In addition, Africa needs to be taken to address, needs to be seen Action needs to be taken to address climate change issues and other environmental factors that pose great risks to the agricultural sector. Now, when, how is the economy of African agriculture structured? If we say that agriculture can play a meaningful role in the economy, what kind of agriculture are we talking about? What are the characteristics of this African agriculture? The economics of African agriculture, which must be captured for better policy making, so that agriculture plays a meaningful role in the transition of the continent, include examining issues such as what? The pervasive and predominant subsistence agriculture, the nature of household production and consumption decisions, capital and savings conditions and credit, technology availability and adoption, decision making in agricultural households, as well as transformation of subsistence agriculture. In the face of the subsistence agriculture that is prevalent in, in Africa, we can look at African farms and classify them on two dimensions, the degree of subsistence production, as well as the degree of commercialization, okay? And on the other hand, is the degree of being a family farm as opposed to a commercial farm where there is higher level. And there are other subclassifications that can be generated from this. You have subsistence production family farms. So subsistence production, family farms that produce largely for own consumption, subsistence production, non-family farms, subsistence production, which they do not use only family workers. You have commercial family farms, farm family like you have with the white families in South Africa, producing wheat, potato, and all kinds of commodities, tobacco, solely for commercial purpose, not for household consumption. And then you have commercial non-family farms, owned by organization and enterprises that produce to feed the chains of supermarkets. And subsistence production has some very clear characteristics, like the producer or the owner of the farm works directly on his own farm, using, using family labor, does not employ non-family permanent labor, may hire temporary non-family labor, if the owner is the manager of the farm himself, some of the household income, most of the household income comes from the family farm, limited access to land and capital. The owners of the land, they live in the farm or near the farm at times. And even the income that comes from the farm is so small, not above a certain level. And, the, and above all, the farm is not a commercial farm because it is not market-oriented but as well as not being registered as a joint stock company or other 
any other type of commercial enterprise. The FAO of the United Nations, as part of its strategic planning for the International Year of Family Farming to 2014, defines such family farms as what? A means of organizing agriculture, forestry, fisheries, pastoral and aquaculture production, which is managed and operated by either a family and predominantly reliant on family labor, including both women and men's labor. The family and the farm are linked, co-evolve and combine economic, environmental, social and cultural functions. Globally, family farms are, are predominant, even in Asia and Latin America, constituting over 98% of all farms and work on 53% of agricultural land. In Africa, there are, three, there are 33 million farms of less than two hectares and counting for 80% of all farms, okay? And the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations credits these small scale farms and fa family farms with contributing to global food security. In other words, having sufficient quantities of food available on a consistent basis through the use of more sustainable agricultural practices. So th this is very, very interesting and instructive. But with these small farms playing an important role in food security, playing an important role in agricultural production, producing even industrial raw materials. As managers of those farms, decisions have to be made by the owners of those farms. So household production and consumption decisions are very, very important. And in some of these small farms, the production and consumption decisions are jointly made. Households do two fundamental things vital to the economy. They demand goods and services from product markets, they supply labor, capital, land, and entrepreneurial ability to resource markets. And when we talk of household here, we refer to groups of people, related or unrelated, who live together in the same dwelling, connected premises, eat from the same port, who acknowledge one adult member as the head of the household, and who have common arrangements for cooking and eating. Agricultural households in Africa, in particular, make joint decisions over consumption, production, and labor supply. So this is very, very interesting because before they go to the farm to produce, other factors have to be taken into consideration. The quantity needed for consumption, as well as the number of persons in the households that are going to engage in labor supply. In other words, households are both producers and consumers. Producers because they choose their location of labor and other inputs to crop or livestock production. And they're also consumers because they choose their location of income from the farm profits and labor sales to the consumption of commodities, either from the farm or from the market. So this is part of, so when we talk of the, the household production and consumption decisions, in other ways, we're referring to family economics, okay? Covering economic concepts such as production, division of labor, distribution, and decision-making to the family. The nature of the joint decisions made within rural households, especially within the peasant households, that dominate African agriculture are important in influencing the effectiveness of agricultural policy. So we are looking at this because when you want to make policy to ensure that agriculture fulfills its promise for the continent, you have to know the characteristics of how that agriculture is, how it is structured, who are the managers, how do they make decisions in those farms? And here we are saying that the households, they make joint production, consumption and labor decisions. Therefore, it is important that we acknowledge how this household functions because it's going to influence the effectiveness of agricultural policy and response to public sector spending to address the welfare needs in rural areas. Remember, we also looked at those economic growth theories that talked about capital, that talked about savings, and that talked about credit, okay? So the economics of African agriculture will ensure that policy making can go through the agricultural sector to influence the overall agricultural economy as well as the national economy and make progress in economic development. So how are the issues of capital and savings happening in the agriculture, in, in African agriculture? Savings and credit are important for farm investments as well as agricultural development. But you, you will recall that in most of our African countries, there is a big challenge in accessing credit from commercial institutions, commercial financial institutions. And therefore there's a proliferation of micro credit and micro financial institutions. 
Rural credit is important and it's a powerful instrument against poverty reduction and development in rural areas. Farmers are particularly in need of credit. Farmers particularly in need of credit because of the seasonal pattern of their activities and periodic uncertainty they face in undertaking agriculture. And there, there is evidence, you know, from studies, take, studies across some countries in the continent that many farmers purchase external inputs such as fertilizers, seeds and pesticides and herbicides. And therefore they have to have access to credit. Agricultural credit will enhance productivity, promote standard of living by breaking the vicious cycle of poverty of small scale farmers. Small scale farmers should not rely directly on what they, they, they own. They should have ac access to externally generated savings, which they can borrow and plow into their farms. Okay? Farmers and agro enterprises require an assortment of capital to succeed, to thrive. Okay? The demand for finance in agriculture spans a range of different types of capital. They need short term trade finance, they need short term credits, as well as long term debts and equity investments if they are big commercial farms. Okay. This includes, for instance, short-term working capital that farmers will use to purchase seeds and fertilizers and farm inputs on a seasonal basis, operate an agro-processing facility. The demand for finance in agriculture also includes medium-term financing for farm or agro-processing equipment, as well as long-term debt and equity investments in capital equipment and land. Finance therefore matters because it is a cat capitalist, it is a catalyst for growth. Finance is a catalyst for growth. Finance deals with savings, access to credit, and access to financial capital for investments. In summary, therefore, rural development policies and programs that promote broad development of the rural non-farm sector will promote farm input purchases, thus productivity and food security. These policies and programs will be important complements to credit and social policies and programs. Then there's also another dimension, the dimension of technology to grow the African agriculture, to move from one level to the next, to grow the African agriculture, to move away from peasant subsistence into commercially oriented enterprises, which creates jobs, creates opportunities for women, men, boys and girls. We have to talk about technology adoption and availability of technology. Africa ranks low in the world in terms of use of modern seeds inputs and other scalable agricultural solutions. African farmers will therefore need additional new tools to improve yields and fertilizers. Tele technologies have not moved to scale in Africa due to many factors, okay? There are weak agricultural extension systems, poor linkages between research and extension services, lengthy technology verification and release systems, a focus on national boundaries instead of strengthening partnerships across agroecological zones and insufficient attention to private sector players along the commodity value chains. Another factor that is another factor is that Africa is dominant, is dominated by family farms, which relies on family level. And getting these farmers to adopt new technologies requires a new way of thinking. In addition, some existing knowledge and technologies from the research institutes are still found in shelves and not with the end users who are the farmers. Therefore, technology adoption has to be promoted because. The simple rudimentary technologies used in African agriculture is unable to address the scale of production that we want for the Africa that we want, for the Africa that we aspire. The simple rudimentary technologies are not enough to generate the required food, ensure food security, produce industrial raw materials, and benefit and allow Africa to benefit from the gains of international agricultural trade. Technology adoption can increase agricultural productivity and diversification, leading to improved food and nutrition security, job creation and through expanded commercialization and industrialization, okay? This is expected to improve socioeconomic status of farmers, including women and youth, through the expected higher incomes. Other benefits from technology access and adoption are the reduction in vulnerabilities to market price fluctuations due to more reliable supplies leading to better organized and accessible markets. With technology, African farmers can enjoy improved soils, okay? land and water management practices as a result of good agricultural practices, which they can afford to invest in. They can afford to invest in and increase resilience to climate variability and stress through the deployment of climate smart agricultural technologies and innovation.
we cannot end the story of the role of agriculture in economic development without also looking at examining and talking about decision making in agricultural enterprises and agricultural households. It's very, very important. The capacity of the decision makers, the farm managers, the awareness and the, the accessibility to tools which they can use to address the different decisions that are required. And there are diverse decisions that need to be undertaken or need to be made. You have management, operational management decisions, administrative decisions, and marketing decisions. Okay. And some of these are strategic management decisions, which are very, very important. And operational management decisions are decisions made on a day-to-day -day basis to run the farm and the and the enterprise, as well as administrative decisions that deal with financing, you know, you know of the farm of the farm business, uh, supervision of work, accounting and bookkeeping adjustments, as well as marketing decisions on the buying of farm inputs and selling of farm inputs. The effort must be put to transform African agriculture away from subsistence agricultural production. Africa can no longer rely on subsistence agriculture to drive its economy forward. The path of African agriculture will depend on the fate of subsistence family, farm, subsistence family farming systems. Building a sustainable intensification around these family farms is a fundamental strategy to adopt. So if we are still relying on family farms, then we have to talk about sustainable intensification. Those small farms have to use enough technology, resources, financial capital, human capital, biological capital to be able to produce as much commodities as possible within the same piece of land. Therefore, the success of this intensification will be accompanied by increased access to markets, which allows producers to put surplus production on the market while respecting quality standards and receiving in return a remunerative price. The obstacles faced by small producers are numerous. Yes, we know African farmers face a lot of challenges, high transaction costs, high post-harvest losses, uh, counterproductive government policies, high cost of inputs. You know, this needs to be, co to, be, to be corrected. In summary, therefore, is that agriculture has an important role to play within the African economy. Agriculture is an important machinery is an important conduit through which the majority of people who live in the rural areas and the sheer volumes of persons employed in the agricultural sector, directly or indirectly, if government policy is made to address the challenges that are faced by the agricultural sector, and these volumes of people actually exist, act out a living out of this sector, and when their conditions are improved upon, it's, it shall be a significant contribution and an important contribution in alleviating the stress of a significant proportion of African people. Thank you so much. And this is the end of module one. It involves us having discussion forums where we can discuss on the strategy and methods through which African countries can use agriculture to be the real engine of economic growth. What strategies and methods and techniques do you think that African countries can use for agriculture to be the real engine of economic growth? Thank you.